All right, continuing on with this idea of the, uh, and you're limiting uh, your idea of this, the rail, the uh, rail gen equation for a, um, for a sublattice solution for the solvent. Okay, and a little bit more on with molten salts. The liquid solutions of make this is 17, uh, this is a um, homework problem, uh, series 17, number three. 17.3. Okay, liquid solutions of MgCl2 and KCl can, are used as electrolytes for depositing magnesium. The activity of KCl uh, at 800 degrees Celsius has been measured as a function of the mole fraction of magnesium chloride. So KCl is the solvent. We're rich in KCl, so the mole fraction of magnesium chloride. This is pure calcium chloride. And these are the uh, mole fractions of magnesium chloride. So it's not super dilute, but we're still going to assume it's the dilute solution. We're assuming that we'll assume that Rayleigh's law applies. It's not too bad, actually. Suppose that the solution is an ideal solution of the ions which are in the solution, according to what we said, according to the definition of Temkin. So this is a Temkin solution. Uh, and find a model for this solution. That is, what ions are in the solution. Okay, I'm introducing here now the concept of what you might call complex ions. So let, let's start off with, let's suppose, here's a model. You have KCl, let's suppose we have potassium chlorine, we have magnesium and chlorine. In other words, our model is going to be potassium, magnesium, <coughs> chlorine. Okay, this is the way we like to write it now. So this is our model. We're mixing KCl. We've got KCl and we've got MgCl2. The solution's rich in KCl, so we're going to apply, this is approximate, we're going to apply the uh, temp, the um, Reilds law thing. Okay, so the activity of KCl is going to be the site fraction of potassium times the site fraction of chlorine. That's always the case. That's your Henry and that's your Reiltian expression. And the limit is xKCl. The mole fraction of KCl is approaching 1. The activity of calcium chloride is going to be, potassium chloride is going to be equal to the site fraction of potassium times the site fraction of chlorine. Okay. But as we showed in the previous example, the site fractions depend upon what's on the lattice sites, what ions are there. In the previous example, we had vacancies, for example, are, can occupy lattice sites. Okay, so let's take a simple model. We'll take model number one here. And we'll assume that it's completely dissociated into potassium ions and magnesium ions uh, mix on one lattice, and on the other lattice you have only you have only chlorine ions. Okay. In that particular case, then the site fraction of potassium ions uh, is simply equal to the number of moles of KCl. The site fraction of magnesium ions is simply equal to the number of moles of MgCl2. Every magnesium contributes one. Every MgCl2 contributes a magnesium. Every KCl contributes a potassium. This is really use its Temkin model for the liquid. That is, we don't talk about vacancies. The number of cation sites are simply equal to the number of cations. The number of anion sites equal to the number of anions. Okay, so in this particular case, then, the activity of KCl is the site fraction of potassium. And what is the site fraction of chlorine? One. Chlorine, all, all anion sites are occupied by chlorine. So the site fraction of chlorine is one times 1.0. So it's just the potassium and the magnesium are mixing. And so this is the number of moles of KCl developed, divided by the number of moles of KCl plus the number of moles of and GCl2. Site fraction is site fraction is the number of moles of potassium over the number of moles of potassium plus the number of moles of magnesium, which is NKCl over NKCl plus NGCl2, which is just equal to the mole fraction of KCl. Does anybody not see what I've done there? All right. You understand what I mean by NKCl and NMGCl2. You're mixing number moles of KCl is the number of moles of KCl and MgCl2 that I'm mixing overall. 
the number of moles of KCl is equal to the number of moles. Uh, okay, I should have written all this down before. This is wrong. The number of moles of potassium. Let me get it right. The number of moles of potassium is the number of moles of KCl. The number of moles of magnesium is the number of moles of magnesium chloride because every potassium chloride contributes to potassium, every magnesium chloride contributes to magnesium. The site fraction then of potassium is equal to the number of moles of potassium over the number of moles of magnesium plus the number of moles of potassium. That is simply the definition of the site fraction. It's the number of moles of potassium divided by the total number of sites on the cation lattice. The site fraction of magnesium then is clearly 1 minus the site fraction of potassium. The site fraction of chlorine equals 1. Every chlorine site is occupied by a chlorine. There are no other anions on the anion sublattice. Okay, so. So now we come back, this is the general equation which we use. The activity of KCl is the product of the site fractions. The site fraction of chlorine is 1. There's no mixing on the chlorine lattice, so there's no contribution to the activity. And the site fraction of potassium is equal to the number of moles of potassium or the number of moles of magnesium plus the number of moles of potassium. But the number of moles of potassium is equal to the number of moles of KCl. The number of moles of magnesium is equal to the number of moles of MgCl2. So this comes out to be equal to this. So this is simply the mole fraction of KCl. Obviously, you're just mixing potassium and magnesium on their lattice. So it's the mole fraction of KCl. And that does not agree very well with the uh, results. This should be then 0 0.9, 0 0.8. should be 0 0.9, 0 0.8, 0 0.7, it isn't anywhere near what you observe. Okay, it has been proposed in these systems that we have what they call complex anions. So we're going to be talking about this more next week, exactly what a complex anion is. Certainly in aqueous solutions, if you put metals into aqueous solution, uh, ions dissolved in water, you can have complex ions. You can have things like NiCl4, uh, minus. This is a complex ion. It's a nickel ion with chlorines around it. It's two ions actually. And two net negative charges. This is a, a negative ion which goes around as a com called a complex anion. NiCl4 is a complex negative ion. You definitely see the spectrum of these things in water and so on. Okay. And if you take a mixture of KCl and MgCl2 of molten salt and you do a Raman spectra or an infrared spectra on it, you will see vibrational spectra which correspond reasonably closely to what you would expect for an MgCl4 complex anion. So this is a complex anion which contains a total of two negative charges, it's a complex ion that goes around like a molecule. And you see vibrational spectra, which come fairly close to what you would expect, and they correspond to the similar things that you would get in water. So this is what's been proposed then. It's been proposed that the magnesium and the chlorine form a complex negative ion. So the mixing model would be this. The cation sites are occupied only by potassium ions. And on the anion sites, you have chlorine, and you have these MgCl4 2 minus complex ions. Okay, let's draw the lattice like this. You have positive ions. Okay, all the positive lattice sites are occupied by potassium. And on the negative lattice sites, you can have chlorine ions, or you can have Mg. Cl4 ions, which occupy an MgCl4 ion occupies one site, and it's a negative ion site. Yeah. Here's another MgCl4 if you like. These MgCl4s are actually a tetrahedral affair with the magnesium and four chlorines going up. Okay, and they're anions, negative ions, which occupy negative ion sites. So, in the limit, all the positive ion sites are occupied by potassium ions. And the negative lattice is a mixture of chlorines and MgCl4 two minuses. Okay. 
Okay, now how do we then solve the equations for that, for that model? And that is what I tried to write down here, I do believe. Okay, so once again we're diluting the rich in potassium chloride, so we're applying the Temkin model. The Temkin model here simply says that the number of sites on the negative lattice is equal to the sum of the, of the atoms that are the ions that are there. The activity of KCl is still equal to the product of the site fractions. This always holds. It's equal to the product of the site fractions because you're dealing with Reynolds' law in the limit. What is the site fraction of potassium? Remember, this is rich in KCl, so there are no magnesium ions left over. All the magnesium ions can form MgCl4 because there, there's lots more chlorine than there is magnesium. So the site fraction of potassium equals one. All the positive ion, all the positive lattice sites are occupied by potassium. So the site fraction of potassium is equal to one. And here we have the site fraction of chlorine. And the site fraction of chlorine then is the number of chlorides over the total number of ions, the total number of negative ions, the total number of lattice sites. Okay, the, the site fraction of chlorine is the number of moles of chlorine divided by the total number of negative ion sites. In the Temkin model, the total number of negative ion sites equals the total number of negative ions. If you want to rephrase the Temkin model that way, it simply says that the number of sites on any lattice is equal to the number of particles that occupy that lattice. There's no vacancies, nothing out there. Okay, but what do we then write for the number of moles of chlorine? Okay, every you have KCl and you have MgCl2. Every KCl supplies a chlorine. Okay. Uh, okay, we better write this out. This was written for a... What's happening now is a magnesium ion picks up four chlorines to form an MgCl4. Okay. So what are the number of moles of well, the number of moles of uh, the number of moles of potassium ions is equal to the number of moles of KCl. Obviously, every potassium gives you a chlorine. The number of moles of MgCl4 ions is equal to the number of moles of MgCl2. Okay, because every MgCl2 forms an MgCl4. You have more potassium chloride. The potassium chloride is the solvent, so you got a lot of chlorine. So. There's enough chlorine so that every magnesium can form an MgCl4. So the number of MgCl4s is equal to the number of MgCl2s which you put in. And the number of moles of chlorine now is equal to the number of moles of KCl. Okay, so every, every KCl supplies a chlorine, but every magnesium chloride takes two chlorines away. Basically you have MgCl2, maybe you could write it this way, an MgCl2 plus two chlorines forms an MgCl4 ion. So you add MgCl2, you take two chlorine ions that were, that were contributed by the potassium, and you form an MgCl4, two minus I. So the number of moles of chlorine, or the number of moles of KCl, minus two times the number of moles of MgCl2. Every potassium chloride contributes a chlorine, every magnesium chloride removes two chlorines. Hence, the number of moles of chlorine is equal to NKCl minus 2 NMgCl2, the number of moles of chlorine again, the number of moles of MgCl4 is the number of moles of MgCl2. Putting these all together, and NKCl plus NMgCl2 is N total. Put this through, so you get XKCl minus 2 XMgCl2, XKCl minus XMgCl2, or if you simplify it around, you end up with this. So in this model, the ideal activity of KCl, if you form nothing but these complex ions, would be equal to this. Okay. And then if you substitute in the various values of XMgCl2, uh, you end up with uh, something that comes very close. Actually, I didn't show the answer here, so it's, let's just do one. Uh, suppose that XMgCl2 equals 0.3, then the activity of KCl should then be equal to uh, 1 minus 0.9, should so 0.1 uh, divided by 
0.4, right? This is 0.25. So in that model, the activity of KCL should be. So if you plug into here, if you say XMGCL2 is 0.3, and you put that into this model, you end up with activity of KCL is 0.25. Um, Point two, you should end up in point one. You should end up with something fairly close to that. So that seems to verify then this limiting model. Now you could check other models. I mean, you, the, why MGCL four? Well, I mean, you could check a different model. Let's suppose is that you have MGCL uh, three ions. In that case, MGCL three minus. And now you can do a similar mass balance. Okay, now the number of MgCl3s, the number of MgCl3 minuses would be the number of MgCl2s, the number of chlorine would be NkCl minus 1 times and MgCl2, because every potassium chloride produces a chlorine, every MgCl2 would remove, we're assuming a different model now, we're assuming MgCl3 anions rather than MgCl4, go through the whole thing, do what I did, and of course you find out something in intermediate between the two models I just did. But this is the one that fits best, the MGCL4. Again, the activity, the ideal activity is just the product of the site fractions, but you've got to decide what's on the sites. Okay, so this is the various complex ion models for, uh, for molten salts. Examine this equation a little bit more. You see how the activity is going down much faster. In the model, which you had potassium and magnesium ions, the activity here, the activity of KCl here would be 0.7. It's already dropped to 0.25. This is going much, much down, much, much faster. Uh, if you go back to the equation here, this is the equation we derived. When let's put in XMgCl2 equals one third. So you've got one-third, uh, mole fraction of MgCl2 is one-third in the KCl-MgCl2 system. In this case, then, the activity of KCl goes to zero. Now, what does that mean? Well, when the mole fraction, when the mole fraction of MgCl2 equals one-third, that means you have uh, two moles of KCl for every mole of MgCl2. In other words, your overall composition is K2MgCl4. That is two-thirds of a mole of KCl, one-third of a mole of MgCl2. Okay, so now you have a pure salt. I mean, you have the positive site, you have only potassium on the positive ion in the sites, and you have only magnesium. So you have only, you have only that one cation. All the cation sites are occupied by potassium. All the negative ion sites are occupied by MgCl4. In that case, the activity of K2 and MgCl4 would be equal to 1. And so you've got the system KCl, K2, MgCl4, the activity of KCl is 0. It's like a binary system, KCl, KMgCl4. Sodium chloride, potassium, you just different ion. Potassium chloride, potassium, MgCl4. If it's infinitely strong, of course, these things are never completely complex. There's some dissociation. This also shows, of course, that now this model does not apply for higher out concentrations of MgCl2, obviously, because you can't go higher than that and still have MgCl4. You don't have enough chlorine. If you're going to add more MgCl2 than 33%, you can't have MgCl4 ions because you, you need two chlorines. You need twice. Okay, so you're at, that's the limit. So this model really only applies up to one third. So in reality, when you take the system and you plot, uh, if this is the activity of KCl, and this is the mole fraction of MgCl2, starts up here at one. If you take your ideal mixing model, of course, this goes off here. This is the mole fraction of magnesium chloride equals 1.0. So this would be the line for. Uh, your potassium, magnesium, the chlorine well, activity is equal to mole fraction, and your this model here is going to give you an activity of potassium chloride that goes to zero, 
at one third. This this line here would be your uh, potassium chlorine MgCl4. The model with potassium and magnesium mixing goes activity of potassium chloride goes from one at pure KCl to zero at pure magnesium chloride. The model for KCl MgCl4 go activity of KCl goes from one per KCl to zero when you're at the composition of K2-MgCl4. The actual system, of course, has a strong complexing, but it's not infinitely strong, so it tends to go something like that. If you were to do this other model with MgCl3, where would it equal 50% at zero? If you had only MgCl3 ions, then you would run out of chlorine at 50%. Okay, so the MgCl1 would come down here and would go to zero at 50%. MgCl2, that model. That then would be K. 50% would be K MgCl3, where you'd have only potassium ions, only MgCl3 ions, like a pure salt, zero entropy. Okay, now this is a very simple solve, but it gives you an idea of what, uh, how the complexing can affect the... Uh, so this in the complex anion model of molten salts, you're assuming a complex negative ion like MgCl3, MgCl4, and so on. You can have in the, things like aluminum fluoride, you could have AlF4 complex ions, you can have Al... Uh, AlF6 3 minus complex ions, you can have AlF5 2 minus complex ions, all mixing with fluorine on one sublattice. You do the mass balance and work the whole thing up. Remember this where I said the activity of KCl equals the product of the site fractions. That is Rayleigh's law. It's assuming that it's an ideal entropy of mixing and it only applies in the region which is quite rich in KCl. This certainly would not apply to the activity of magnesium chloride in this system, not at all, because you're not. It only applies to the activity of KCl. Okay, the most important, okay, so that was KCl, MgCl2. A lot of systems, molten salt systems, work out that way. I'm going to talk next week about molten salt systems more in general. I'm just kind of introducing it here in the quasi, in the sublattice model. But your best thing of that, the most important system is systems like calcium oxide silica, or magnesium oxide silica, or sodium oxide silica. This is called an acidic oxide. And this is called a basic oxide. These are basic oxides. The basic oxides tend to form oxygen ions. I'll be dealing with slags next week, but so that you can do some of the homework problems. This is called, over here, this is called the basic region. Basic composition region. Which is up to the mole fraction of silica equals to one-third. So the basic region is compositions which are rich in the basic oxides. So Slags which are rich in the basic oxide are called basic slags. And they contain mainly basic oxides and silica up to one third in the calcium oxide at least. Right. Let's take this up. And in the basic region, it's very much like the KCL MgCl2 system. The basic oxide like CaO and MgO are oxides that tend to dissociate into simply cations and oxygen ions, O2 minus ions. The silica, however, in this region tends to form SiO4 complexes. So in this basic region, you're going to have calcium ions, you're going to have oxygen ions, and you're going to have SiO4, 4 minus complex anions. And this is just like the KCl. MgCl2. Or in the basic region, you model it as calcium uh, on the cation sites, 
and on the anion sites you have oxygen and you have SiO4 four minus. So it's just the same as the, the potassium, magnesium, Cl4, except calcium instead of potassium, silicon instead of magnesium, and the charges are all one higher. Okay, so the activity of K calcium oxide is the site fraction of calcium times the site fraction of oxygen. Where the site fraction of oxygen is calculated based on the fact that you have oxygen ions contributed by the calcium oxide, and you have ortho SiO4, 4 minus. Uh, complex anions contributed by the silica. So the number of moles of SiO4, the number of moles of <coughs> SiO4 ions is equal to the number of moles of SiO2, just like the magnesium chloride case here. Uh, the number of moles of oxygen ions is equal to the number of moles of calcium oxide minus two times the number of moles of SiO2. And the whole thing goes to zero at this composition, which is the Ca2SiO4 composition. Two calcium oxides, one silicon. At which you have only calcium ions on one sublattice, only the SiO4 ions on the other lattice. Exactly the same as what we did here for potassium, chlorine, magnesium, read calcium, oxygen, silicon, you got the same. The same model. So the activity of calcium oxide goes from one for pure calcium oxide down to zero at one third. And as a simple model for basic slice, for the activity of the basic oxide, not the activity of silica, but the activity of the basic oxide in the basic region, this is you know a pretty good first approximation for a lot of these slags. Now, supposing you have another I in here, well that's fine, you've got magnesium. Still the same thing, the activity of calcium oxide will be the site fraction of calcium times the site fraction of oxygen. Okay, so the activity of calcium oxide is the site fraction of calcium on that site times the site fraction of oxygen on that site, taking into account your mass balances. If you're going to put sodium on this site over here, the sodium is also going to go on the cation sites. Now you have to be careful because now the sodium is Na2O. If you just had sodium oxide and silica, the minimum would be, if you were just to have sodium oxide and silica, if you just had Na2O and silica, then your model would be sodium ions on one sublattice, um, oxygen and SiO4 on the other lattice. Your activity of sodium oxide is going to be the site fraction of sodium squared times the site fraction of oxygen. Site fraction of sodium, of course, is one if you just have sodium oxide silica. And your minimum is going to occur at the composition Na4SiO4. Where you have only sodium ions and silica. It's because the silica, sodium is unit charge, calcium is two charge. If you have a mixture on the one lattice of sodium, magnesium, and calcium, then you have to do the whole mass balance thing and figure out how, how it goes. Okay, and this is a remarkably good thing, and, and it, it applies, of course, only over the basic region. Only up to the region in which you can, all the silica can be SiO4. Once you pass this basic region, then you no longer have enough oxygens to satisfy all the silicons. The silicons Every silicon can form an SiO4 because you don't have enough oxygen. But then more, much more complicated things start to happen. But, <clears throat> well, they actually start to happen even before you get here, but in many cases not much before you get here. We're up to a fairly close to the orthosilicate composition. A lot of these slags are quite nicely modeled by simply positive ions, cal the calcium, magnesium, sodium, all the all the positive ions randomly mix on the cation sites, and on the anion sites you have oxygen ions and you have orthosilicates. The number of orthosilicates, these are called orthosilicate ions, by the way. Every silicon forms an orthosilicate, and the number of oxygens are simply the number of oxygens that are left over after you form your orthosilicates. So you can do the mass balance. 
let us say you have some sulfide ion in there, so you're dealing with a very low oxygen potential, so you don't have sulfate. You have sulfide ions. In that case, sulfide ions do not form complexes. Uh, you don't form SIS4 complexes. The sulfide ions all the sulfide ions would all go as, uh, as, an, as S2 minus. So if you have a basic region, basic region, which basically means the mole fraction of silica is small. In other words, well, there's enough oxygen so that every silicon can form an SiO4 is what you mean by a basic region. Okay, and then you would, could have, say you're mixing, you're making a mixture of say calcium oxide, calcium sulfide, sodium oxide, SiO2, and whatever your model would be, sodium, calcium, magnesium, and so on, all the cations on one sublattice, and on the other sublattice you would have oxygen ions, sulfide ions, and SiO4. Okay, so your anions are oxygen, sulfide, and orthosilicates. The number of orthosilicates will be equal to the number of silicons that you add, the number of moles of oxygen are the oxygens that came from the basic oxides minus those that were taken up by the silica. The number of sulfide ions is simply the number of sulfide ions you put in. Okay, so on one sublattice you have the basic cations. On the other sublattice you have all the sulfide ions, the orthosilicate ions, and the oxygen ions that were left over. And the activity of, for example, sodium oxide would then be the site fraction of sodium squared times the site fraction of oxygen. The activity of sodium sulfide would be the site fraction of sulfur squared times the site fraction of sulfur and so on in this ideal solution model. Now we can talk later about the deviations from ideal solution, which are of course very important, but this in the basic region, this is the main thing that goes on. Basically the cations mix on one lattice. The anions mix on the other lattice, and almost all the silicons are in the form of SiO4. So your first equation. This works for activity of, your, of everything that doesn't contain silica. If you've got the activity of SiO2, this doesn't work at all. You, oh, well, I'll show you why it doesn't work. The SiO2, it doesn't work. Well, you can't do it. You can't work it into the scheme. So I can give you some homework problems in which I give you a slag is formed of five moles of CaO, three moles of this, two moles of this, one mole of this. In the basic region, this will be small. In the basic region, write an expression, approximate expression for the activity of sodium sulfide. This is how you got to do it. Really straightforward. Okay, this is this an introduction to complex ions and molten salts and so on, but it works not too, uh, not too terribly bad. Okay, we talked, that's where I'm going to stop. We talked about, I'm going to give you some homework problems for Tuesday, because it was on Wednesday. These homework problems are for the, uh, the ma material for the quiz ends here. So everything up to here is on the quiz next Wednesday. It's from the previous. I'm not going to ask you questions like last. The first quiz was based all fundamental thermodynamics. The second quiz is going to be from there up to here, so this will be on modeling. But we've taken up till now everything, including this, including these homework problems, which will be uh, 17, 4, 14, and 17. 2003. These are actually pretty straightforward. 2003, 2, 2, 2006, 2, 2. Those are on the salt stuff I talked about, and then there's a couple on the uh, the defects. The you know the non-stoichiometric compounds A, B with vacancies, substitutional defects, and so on. Uh, again, they're fairly straightforward. 2008 to 5.
And then if you look on here, you'll see 1996 4. This is in a separate, this is in the That's here. This is uh, uh, file number 35. So this is in file number 35 in the uh, on the website on the server. <coughs> this is in file number 46 on the server. And these are in file number 30. Okay, so these will be for Tuesday, and so everything was on all the modeling and everything up to here. We've got an awful lot left in the course after this. Um, We'll do some review and so on, and the final exam can be again on the whole. Same as last time, open book, uh, lots of time. So the course on Tuesday, and the exam is here on Wednesday at 9 30, 10, whatever you want. Exam was <coughs> so the exam's on Thursday, and we're having a course on Wednesday. Is that it? That's how it works. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Course on Tuesday and Wednesday. The exam's on Thursday. Okay. Sorry.